Apostates Anonymous, the show you turn to when you're no longer an evangelical, with your hosts, hosts, authors Keith Giles and Matthew J. DiStefano. Welcome back to another episode. Oh, man, I'm a little hot on the mic there. <laughs> Whoa. Let me, let me start that over. Hold on. Let me turn this down. Jesus. Damn. Coming out Damn, strong. Back up. Coming out strong. Welcome back to another episode of Apostates Anonymous. Keith, how are you today? How are you? How are you? I'm doing great, man. Uh, so excited about another episode of Apostates Anonymous. This is a lot of fun, I got to say. I really love doing these uh, these with you. So I got to say, well... You know, it's what, your fourth podcast? How many podcasts do you have these days? I have four, I believe. Yes. I do yeah. Second Cup with Keith, Threads, Apostates Anonymous, this one, and uh, Heretic Happy Hour. Yep. And I have a feeling, I don't know how I know this or why I think this, but I'm guessing that Threads and Second Cup, the, I'm, I'm just, the universe is telling me that the audio quality is going to be really good from here on out. Yes, I, I think you're right. We, we just picked up a brand <laughs> new producer and he is I heard amazing. he's fantastic. Oh, he is one of the best. He's one of the best in the business. Yes. Of course, I'm so speaking about myself. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, there you go. A big, uh, a big coup there. Like, wow, bringing Matt and Stefano into the second cup in Threads universe. Yeah, it's going to go downhill from here now. <laughs> <laughs> well, well uh, yeah. So today we have, um, well, we've talked about one of your books. I thought we would talk about one of my books. And I think it's going to set up something nicely because we're professionals here. We, we, uh, we tie the threads together. Is that, is that the right podcast? Yeah. Um, we tie the threads together. Of, we're going to talk about my book, Heretic, which is going to set up for next week's, or in two weeks, I should say, the yeah. episode, because you came out full heretic on Pathios. And That's I want right. to talk, talk about that next. Yeah, after this. After this. But first, your book, Heretic. First, my book, Heretic. But actually, first, first, a word from our sponsor. We, oh, have, yeah. another, we have another solid one today, and I... I just uh, got done editing it, and it's um, mwah, it's a beautiful uh, it's a beautiful sponsor today. <laughs> yeah, it's really one of my favorite parts of this podcast is the fact that we have sponsors. So yeah, yeah, bring in that money. So let's ro- let's roll out that uh, the beautiful sponsor footage. <laughs> Are you a flag loving American patriot? Do you love freedom more than anything? Well, we just launched our new brand, American Freedom Lovers, and we're on a search for our first small group of dedicated patriots to help test our new products as they are developed. When you become an American Freedom Lovers beta tester, you'll receive exclusive access to heavily discounted and even free products as they're released, exclusive videos, articles, and tips on fighting for America and how to take back our country's freedom and greatness and access to our community of like-minded patriots where people share their love for America, freedom, and our God-given rights to open carry, refuse vaccines, and sneeze directly onto the vegetables at the supermarket. If that excites you, friend, then we want to hear from you. Visit us online today at AmericanFreedomLovers.USA to be one of the first beta testers and get access to our entire product line for a free or at a discount before those Marxist communists take over our nation. America. Uh, really gets you. Really gets you there. You know, it I, tugs on so your good. nationalistic heartstrings. Oh, yes. I'm so, so grateful for the, uh, the quality um, sponsors that we have on this show. It's so who's great. that? Who's that voiceover? I thought I recognized that voice as some sort of famous preacher or pastor from Tennessee. Uh, he sounded like the same guy from uh, <laughs> Hot Fuck Tennessee or wherever it was. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, well, be, being from Tennessee, it's uh, one of the most natural things to do is to talk like that. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, fan- fantastic. Uh, I hope everyone checks out their site. and uh, Yeah, please support they, our sponsors, please. Please support our sponsors. In, in support of our sponsors, you support the show. That's right. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. So we're going to talk about Heretic. Yeah. Hey, man. So th- that is, it's such a great book. Um, well, thanks. There's, yeah, there's a... Uh, I remember, how long has it been since it came out? It's been out for two years, three years? Uh, 2018. Oh, man. So it's been almost four years, I think. Wow, that's awesome. 
Yeah, because yeah. uh, there's a video on YouTube of uh, of me and you and Jamal doing a like a uh, like a launch video kind of thing about Heretic yeah. coming out and before a live show. It was right before we did the. Was that our first live show? I think mm, maybe no, 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 because no, we started Heretic Happy Hour in 2017, so we had had a couple. Okay, okay, yeah, but yeah, it's such a great book. So talk about. Um, why, why you made, why you decided to write that book and, and kind of like what it's about? Well, the funny thing is, is before I answer your question is yep. that when I launched the book, I don't know if I've said this on here before, but the first person who got back to me from the launch team was like, do not publish this book. It's, um, <laughs> it reads more of like different essays that have nothing to do with one another. And it, it needs, you know, a lot more development and somehow tying in the concepts together. And I was like, well, yes, that's what the premise is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is. It, so the premise is that, you know, you know, the, dr the drill, if you write something, let's say on Pathios or wherever, if you write about atonement theory and you have a bunch of Calvinists come on your page, you know what they're going to ask. That's right. If you're a universalist and you have a bunch of people who haven't heard of that before, you know they're going to ask, well, what's the point in Jesus? Right. Well, yeah, exactly. Why follow you Jesus know. if everybody yeah. knows? Have yeah. If you're affirming, you're going to be like, well, what about the clobber pad? What about passage X, uh -huh. Y, and Z? Or, or yes. if, you know. So I, I just took 10 of those that I've seen over the last whatever amount of years. And I, I answered them to the best of my ability. And like you, I, I try to bridge the scholarly world to the lay world. And, yeah. and so while I quote a lot of David Bentley Hart and a lot of, you know, folks like that, Alaria Ramelli, and yeah. I don't expect people to necessarily read all those things, but I try to distill their ideas as best as I'm able into um, something that the, the broader world can consume. Yeah. 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 And that, that's what I think is so helpful about the book. It, it really is. I think it's a great book to hand somebody um, who's just maybe started to go through their deconstruction process Yeah, um, because you do kind of address all of the major kinds of things. I call them the pillars. There's like six pillars of deconstruction. Um, yeah. But yeah, you kind of deal with almost all of them and, and a few extras. Uh, so how many yeah. actual topics do you cover in the book? Well, so there's 10. Yeah. Um, so I start with... Um, if, if all are saved, why follow Jesus? Um, I guess I should have the book in front of me. Let's see if I can remember four years <laughs> later. What yeah, I, hate, I hate when I can't remember my own book. <laughs> well, your own book. Um, there, there's, a, there's, a, um, there's a chapter on how Jesus interpreted his scriptures, how he approached it. Um, there's a chapter on violence in the scriptures and what I do with that. Um, there's addressing the charge of Marcionism. Yep. Um, there's addressing the charge that universalism is heretical and has always been heretical, uh -huh. which is false as we've discussed. Um, no, sorry, no, Mark, Mark Driscoll, sorry, said, Mark Driscoll. Mark yeah, Driscoll I, said that historic Christianity has always, always taught eternal torment. <laughs> well, then that's the end of the show. I guess we're wrong. <laughs> there um, you go. Sorry, Mark. No need to, no need to go further. Um, <laughs> I, I address um, God made Adam, God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Oh um, yeah. That's a great one. There's a funny by joke about like it's God made Adam and Eve, not Adam or Eve. So uh, you get, there you, you get go. your yeah, you get your cake and eat it too. Um, you get Adam and Eve, yeah, you can have both. Yeah, yeah you can have both if that's what you want. <laughs> <laughs> there is the cross. If the uh -huh. cross is not penal, um, is it vagin? No, that's not the title. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, there's the uh, the the free will defense of hell. Yeah, that's a good one too. Because that that one does come up a lot, and you know David Bentley Hart has addressed that. Yeah, I use I David Bentley Hart's work a lot in that one. I use Talbot's. My, uh, you know, Mike Machuga's dad, Rick Machuga. Um, he has a lot of philosophical arguments against that defense. Good. Um, you know, using C.S. Lewis's famous "The Gates of Hell Are Locked from the Inside." We talked about this yeah. when we talked about your book. Yeah. Um, then I've got the uh, the end time stuff, Book of Revelation. Yeah, as so opposed to the book of revelations. Uh -huh. um, there's got to be one more. Oh, uh, the wrath of God. What is the so-called wrath of God? There you go. Yeah. So those yeah. are kind of like, so, so here's how I, I take it. You've got your books and they're fully fleshed out books on like penal substitution and hell. Right. Mine would be like the cliff note version of something you're doing in a chapter. So I've got all, right. you know, I've not, not entirely sure. um, parallel, but there's a lot of the same, same yeah. similar threads. 
Yeah, yeah. So that, that's what I mean. That's why I think the Heretic is such a great thing to hand somebody because, yeah, otherwise you'd have to read all seven of my books to get and Who wants in. to do that? Who wants to do that? Seven <laughs> books, man. You could just read Heretic and be done with it. There you go. <laughs> done with it. Move on. You're deconstructed. You're good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how – I mean, um, well, what I love about the book, I was going to ask you what the reaction was to the book, but, um, because, but it reminded me that you actually – made part of the book kind of design some of the choicest uh, comments that people have made about you and your posts and uh, your writings over the years. And I'm in a way kind of jealous because you do have the best trolls. I think you really have the most creative trolls I've ever seen. Yeah. I've got some normal run of the mill trolls, but then I've got some really like articulate trolls who put together some really fantastic (laughs) sentences. And yeah. um, So I mean, you've probably done this. I, I think I think you've told this to me, to my face, uh, that you take some of the stuff that you write on Pathos and you put it yep. into a book. And you might ex- I, I've expanded things in Heretic, sure. but a lot of the stuff I put in Heretic were based on blog posts and then yes. f- and then fleshed out more in the book. And the comments that people give are just fantastic. I mean, a professor of word vomit. That's, that's been my great. favorite title. That's actually my title on. Um, it might be my Facebook bio is just professor of word vomit now. There you go. That's yeah, it's great. Uh, yeah, it's fantastic. And then, you know, longer. So I didn't, I didn't, I didn't seek out any endorsements from anyone. Yeah. I just got them given to me naturally without asking from people <laughs> right. who remained anonymous on Pathios or, you know, had some sort of weird name, but yeah. I just left them anonymous on the, on the book. Cause. Like, yeah. That's so great. Yeah. I love that. Um, so, you know, you wrote this, like we said, what, four something years ago? About four years so? ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, anything about it? Like, would you go back and change any of it? Or, you know, are you you're still kind of the same place in each of those that, that you are now? Well, that's the, that's an interesting question because, like, I don't even know if I was in that place. I was in a place even then where I was like, I don't care about the end times. I don't care what Revelation says. Right. But the premise of the book is for those who do, this is a resource. Uh So that's actually the one book I think that I have that is, is like a fully developed book. Whereas some of my other books are just like kind of just projects that are just kind of fun. Uh, but this is like a fully like I'm putting together a thesis of, of some sorts where yeah. I don't think I would change much of it. Yeah. Even though I don't necessarily I'm trying to think of whether I would even disagree with I would probably I would probably articulate things differently. Right. But I, I but for what it is, I don't think I would change really much of anything. Because like you said, I think it is a great resource for those who are deconstructing. And and I think eventually you'll move past what I write in Heretic, just like right. I have. Right, exactly. No, that's exactly right. Um, and th- you make a good point too. Like I I definitely am in this place now more and more about how, um, you know, like I realize my audience often are are people who are not on the same page as me. They're not where I'm at, right? Right. But I want to talk to them. And so because I know they do, um, let's say, believe that Paul wrote Ephesians or Colossians, um, I will say, as Paul says, and quote right. something from Ephesians. Now, I don't think Paul said that, but I know they do. Right. So I'm not going to say pseudo Paul, because now mm-hmm. it just introduces another, you know, yeah. fly in the ointment of them. Go, wait, wait, what? What? What are you talking about? Yeah. So, you know, yeah, the same thing with Revelation and stuff like that, where like, yeah, I don't take this stuff seriously anymore. I. I don't, uh, I don't, I'm not in the same place, you know, when it comes to my approaches to some of the scriptures and, but yeah, but I'm talking to people who do, or at least yeah. say they do. So I know, okay, if you hold scripture at this sort of high level, then these are the things you should look at and take seriously. And so I'm going to just ask, you know, I'm going to ask the readers to be consistent about that. Right. So right. that's one of the, that's one of the, um, I don't think it's a hard thing to do, but that's one of the balances you have to get on being a bridge between the scholarly world and the lay world, because you could write Paul, as Paul says, and you know, you want to write about this wonderful passage in Colossians 1, 15 through 20, this wonderful, you know, yeah. uh, song that they probably sung. Yeah. Um, and you say, as Paul said, well, a scholar is going to be like, well, hold on. Right. So maybe, maybe you put that in a footnote. Okay. I realize that Paul <laughs> didn't write this, but 
Yeah. But but scholars aren't your target audience. No. Like I don't expect a Pauline scholar to be reading me. No. In fact, I don't. I don't think they do. <laughs> no. And no. that's okay. Right. Um, so, but your tar- your like you just said, your target audience is the people who would think these things. So you're speaking to them. And so that's what like I try to put in the introduction, you know. I mean, this is this is the questions I get most from the, just the common Christian who doesn't, you know, dig into the scholarly works that you and I might. Yeah. So take yeah. from that what you will. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you know what I want to say go back to something too you were saying about, you know, how you and I both will you know, typically blog about some ideas um uh, before we eventually turn in some of these ideas into books, right? Um, and I found that to be a very helpful thing to do because, um, you know, you do get feedback, right? You do mm-hmm. get comments. And so sometimes, and I will say there's, there have been things that, you know, I, I was coming, approaching a topic from a certain perspective. And I think, uh, you know, I'm thinking this is clear and I'm, I mean, this is, you know, I'm doing a wonderful job of communicating uh, whatever, whatever the subject is. But then, you know, then I'll get comments from people like, who completely misunderstood what I was saying or point out something I didn't, you know, Oh, you, you, what you left this part out or you didn't talk about that. So I really have appreciated uh, the the comments, even if they, even especially if they don't agree with me, because quite often, um, in fact, a lot of my books, a couple of my books that I've written recently, I'll even have a whole chapter based on, I I think I even called the chapter like, um, but what about, right. Mm -hmm. And, and typically those are composed of objections and uh, questions and things like that that have arisen when I posted some of these ideas to my blog. And I think that's good because now, okay, I know when I say these things, these are the kinds of reactions I get. These are the kind of questions I have. And so now I get to address those in my book. So being able to blog these things in advance before you just publish it in a book and then go, oops, <laughs> oh, I didn't think about that. Or, oh, I probably should have addressed that. Yeah. Uh, it's really helpful to be able to to kind of float those things out there first on your blog and get some feedback. And that, I think that helps kind of refine your arguments. Yep. I think that's definitely uh, wise words from someone who's been doing it for a long time. Yeah. But like you said too, you don't want to uh, just cut and paste things either. Like you want to be able to say, well, you know, no. here's, here's, here's the nugget of something that I talked about. I mean, so what I'll typically do is um, like when I, when I always do an outline for my books first. So I will, when I'm outlining the book, I might go and look up, um, blog posts I've written on that particular subject. And I might kind of paste a link into there. But when I'm actually coming to write it, I'll probably like click on that link, skim over what I wrote in the blog post, maybe pull out a couple of details out out of it. But as much as possible, try to write something unique, you know, uh, so it doesn't be like people will be reading it going, I read this already. I've read this before. (laughs) Yeah, no, I I definitely don't do that. You know, you got to You got to flesh things out. You got to Heretic was uh, the last. Is it the last book that I wrote with an outline? <laughs> um, <laughs> because I mean, the, the the projects since then haven't really needed one, you know. So the conversations yeah. Mike and I have don't have an outline. The Genesis of Violence is art project, right? Um, devoted. There is a there is a follow. Yeah, devoted <laughs> did not need an outline. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, there is a follow-up to Heretic that I'm writing. I've written six of the chapters. It's it's called Apostate. Ooh. And the subtitle is the subtitle is the same, except it's like instead of a, uh what is the subtitle of the heretic? Um Jesus. Where is it? <laughs> ah, it's too long for me to even remember. So it's a heretic and LGBTQ affirming, divine violence denying Christian universalists' responses to some of evangelical Christianity's most pressing concerns. So I just change a little bit. It's like um, instead of Christian universalist, I drop the Christian. Oh, there you go. Yeah, and um, it's it responses to some of evangelical Christian or more of evangelicals' more pressing concerns or something like that. Yeah. So. Um, can, can I ask you what what are you going to talk about in apostate that you didn't cover in heritage? Oh well, there's there's ten more. Ooh, uh, ten more. What what are they? Let's see. What's the? Uh, do I have a table of contents yet? I think I do. Here we go, baby. Um, yeah, ten more chapters. So in in heretic, I have the first chapter is you know f- about following Jesus. 
yeah. and why we would follow Jesus um, if everyone is saved. In this one, I have it. It's a fo- it's following Jesus, but then I equate to Jesus as the Buddhist concept of of the Bodhisattva. Uh-huh. So I'm not one who believes that Jesus went to the East and you know learned right. Buddhism. Thank you. But I think the transcendental. I mean, maybe he did, but there's no evidence of that, right? As as an right. historian would approach it, no, I I don't see that. Although I think there are a lot of similar teachings and ways of approaching the world. But I think that falls into the realm of something that's transcendental of what it means to be a human rather than something you necessarily learn from right. some sort of d- d- um, doctrines. Yes. So so I, I equate to Jesus to the Bodhisattva in that one. And then in chapter two, I talk about sin and um, kind of Christ- Christianity's obsession with sin and how to better understand sin, not from an original sin standpoint. Thank you. Um, because I... I also do not like the pendulum swinging too far to say there's no such thing as sin and people are just perfect how they are. And it's like, no, well, in, w- in one way, sure. But in another way, like I'm kind of fucked up. And if you're saying you're not, I think you're lying. Right. Um, so, and then chapter three is called women go home question mark playing oh. off of John MacArthur's. Uh, yeah. So a lot of, uh, a lot of chapter three was something that I've published on Pathios, but I've fleshed it out even further and, uh, chapter four is about sex and purity culture. Oh, nice. Uh, chapter five is on, uh, it's called Spare the Compassion, Harm the Child, a playoff, Spare the Rod, Spoil the Child. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it talks about parenting and spanking and nonviolent parenting, uh, building a lot of, um, on maybe like Cindy Wang Brandt's work and yeah. her work on unfundamentalist parenting. Yeah, she's great. Um, yeah, she's wonderful. Um, chapter six is on, uh, thou shalt not kill unless it's state sponsored. So it's on the death penalty and why Christians should not support the death penalty. Yeah. Yeah. Chapter seven is specifically about hell. Uh, in, in heretic, I didn't really talk about hell. I talked about free will, Right. but this, this is more about like, it's more about probably what you did. It's, it's the cliff note version of Jesus yeah. undefeated. Defeated. Yeah. Um, chapter eight is on mind altering substances and drugs and the drug war and um whether you know a lot of those what did we do for uh what was that site that we did some oh, freelance god's work greenery for? god's greenery god's greenery yeah that's such a that is such a weird thing we haven't actually talked about that i think openly very much but uh that was a that bizarre was time where you and i and another friend uh yeah. were we writing rename, remain nameless yeah because he wanted to he wanted to right, right, right. so i'm gonna respect him but yeah the three of us writing articles for this christian website about um well it wasn't it, it was about uh, uh what's it called the um cbd thank you cbd it was all i can think of was thc but it was no the other one not thc but cbd because you're a stoner keith that's well yeah <laughs> and uh i'm really not but uh <laughs> But yeah, there was really it was a it was cool, and we got paid like pretty we well paid. to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, was, that was fun, and I learned a lot from that. Actually, doing all that research, I was like, you know, damn, I, these are things I would never have thought of or looked at before. Yeah, and I'm going to use a lot of what I wrote. Obviously, I'm going to rewrite it because those were very specific. They had yeah. specific things, but but I'm going to take those concepts and talk about that. And then chapter nine, I haven't written, thank God, because it's about deconstruction. What happens with deconstruction? And there's so much new fodder. Uh-huh. On, and like obviously um childers and cooper and all the things they've said yes. so um there was a lot before but i think there's a lot and even more now that's more. right and then chapter 10 will be about um politics um about um i how i view you know how, how spiritual people should view politics and so that one will be I'll really end with a bang and have people very upset by the end of it there you or, go that's- or nodding along i don't know yeah, you know what? See, that's the goal. You got to piss people off. You got to get them like really upset at you. So there you go. Well, I think you have to, in some way, there's some truth to that. I don't go out to try to piss people off or to ruffle feathers or anything. Yeah. But, you know, for the people who, well, the people who are like, let's say Trump supporters aren't going to read my book anyway. Right. But for the people who, I mean, I still think there's a lot of blind spots within a Christian's approach to the world. Like, you know, let's say with like, with, uh, if I talk about in in cannabis in one of the chapters, like I'm also going to talk about the drug war. And even if you don't smoke, you, you should, 
or do any sort of drugs in any sort of way. And even if you think it's wrong, like you have to look at the drug war and think that's wrong as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. You could be totally against drugs any way, shape and form and also be against the drug war because right. it's, it's an objective failure in what, it att- in, in what it attempted to do. Unless what it attempted to do was lock up nonviolent people, especially black folks, then yeah. it succeeded. Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, the war on drugs was actually a war on basically people of color. It, yeah, that that's that's why they, you know, that's why there's stricter laws against like crack because right. crack in the inner city where more black people live is what they use, but rich white kids use cocaine. So right. they they view those two they're, they're the same fucking substance, really. I know, I know. Just in, yeah. in a slightly different form, but yep. but they'll they'll lock up the black folk with folks with crack and give them harsher penalties than the rich white kid who does cocaine at his fraternity house or whatever. Right. No, he's exactly right. No, that sounds great, man. That sounds like a great book. Great follow-up. So it's, 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 yeah, it's more, um, Heretic was more uh, like theological. This one is more like, I guess, uh, is secular the right word? Kind of in how a- applying your faith to the real world circumstances. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I think, and I think that's really great. That's a good, I think it's a very natural progression to kind of talk about those things. But that's so, where yeah, I'm man. at now. Yeah. That's, I mean, I think that's where you're kind of at too. It's like, at least for me, like I needed to get rid of hell as yeah. a doctrine in yeah. order to function as, as a human being without so much trauma. Yeah. I needed to get rid of anti-affirming theology. I needed to get rid of all these things. And so it's almost like, I was just talking to Mike about this. It's almost like, well, now what? How do I, how do I live and move in the world? Yeah. Like, how do I address these things? Like, no longer can I say, I'm a Christian, so I'm a Republican, or right. I'm a Christian, so non Christians go to hell. Or, so it's like, I don't, I don't have the 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 pull to proselytize. I yeah. don't have the pull to evangelize. So how am I going to deal with my neighbor? How am I going to deal with, you know, voting? Or yeah. whether to vote or not to vote. How am I going to deal with legislation? How am I going to deal with uh, my daughter's teachers and th- you know all these sort of yeah. things? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's really good. Yeah, I'm. Um, it's hard. I mean, well, I'm, I'll save it for when we when we talk about my uh, my slide down the slippery slope. <laughs> yes, the, but uh, the heretic's journey a slippery slope to plug the game that eventually game. apparently is going to be coming out in a couple yes. weeks. Four years in the making, and God here it, yes, it, it will better. be hopefully very the soon. The April Fool's joke is going to be that it's not actually coming out. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, exactly. It'll be like, well, no, actually, it's not ready. Uh, but we hope so anyway. Got yeah. Ahead. Well, you know, because it's kind of like, um, you know, you and I, I think you and I have talked about this before. I don't know if we talked about it on this podcast, but um, but I know you and I have talked about it just with between us um, that, yeah, I, I like I secretly – would love one day to write a book that didn't have a single scripture reference in it. Like that would be a dream. And I haven't done it yet. I have a book coming out um, that is, I would say is probably way more um, post Christian than anything else I've done. But at the same time, I'm still quoting scriptures and, you know, kind of, because again, I still feel like I'm talking to people who probably do um, need um, sort of a level of comfort because I'm talking about things I know. I, I know when I'm writing them, I can hear people like getting nervous or getting scared. Like, oh, this sounds like heresy. Oh my gosh. Oh no, no. He's, he's slipping off into something crazy. And so, so because Drips I know. Of sweat are falling on your paperback. <laughs> right. So, so I know, I know that my readers quite often are coming from this very, you know, evangelical kind of world. Even if they're deconstructing, there's still these tapes in your head you haven't, you know, r- replaced yet. And, so when I know when I talk about certain topics, they're getting really nervous and feeling really scared. Like, oh my gosh, this is dangerous. Oh my gosh, this is, this is, you know, this is not good. And so I, I still feel the need to stop and go, just so you know, I know this sounds weird to you, but, and then I'll point to some scriptures that kind of like back up what I'm saying, that it's not completely, you know, I have not left completely the realm of what they would call sort of safe Christian kind of you know, concepts. But I really do look forward to the day when I don't have to do that anymore. You know, I don't even know, yeah. I don't know that I ever can, but, um, but I would love to be able to get to the place one day where I could just talk to people, mm-hmm. not 
Christians, <laughs> but just people about things. And maybe who knows? Maybe I can do that down the road. It may be a, it may be the case where you. I mean, maybe you make a foray into fiction because that's what I've always thought is that you can say a lot more with fiction yeah. by not saying it overtly. Uh huh. Um, well, I so have I thought of that. that. Yeah, I, I actually one, have thought of that. That's one route you could go. Um, I've gone a different route with a book coming up, even though I'm just editing it. It's a book about The Office. So, oh, yeah. You yeah. know, just, you know, something that there's a loose tie into spirituality by looking at the characters through Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey. Yes. But it's not Christian in any way, shape, or form. So it's yeah. and it's not even that spiritual per se. Yeah. Um. So there, there's ways to do it. I don't know if you can talk about spirituality. Yeah. Without referencing it at all, uh, Mike and I don't talk too. We we hardly ever make a reference in our books. But that's that's just a conversation. I mean, that's essentially like what we're doing now. Just yeah. Talking. So and there's ways to do it, but. Yeah, uh, it's it depends on your readership too. I think like you, you tend to you tend to attract people who are still more churched, yeah, less post Christian than I do, and that's why yeah. I think you get you get the pushback more often on like your podcast had a dick joke or <laughs> yes, and it's like, like I, my my readers are like yeah that okay okay you know the podcast is with Matt right <laughs> right. Right. They, yeah, your listeners would be like, if we did a whole podcast and there was not a dick joke, and they'd be that, like, hey, man, what's wrong? Yeah. That's why I loved your endorsement for the genesis of violence. You're like, I'm surprised by this. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, what did I say? Something like surprisingly Christian. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was also written like five years ago. And it right. took the artist, like, it took Zach a long and which I don't, I'm not an artist. So it's all good. Like, it came out when it came out. And, um, it's about Genesis, of course. It's yeah, Christian. Of course, Jewish, of course. Guess, yeah, you, <laughs> no, you can't. You can't help. Yeah, because the whole subject matter is Genesis. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, what I did in um in the book that's coming out, um, like to your point, like you know, it's how hard it is to talk about spiritual things without sort of quoting Jesus or scripture or whatever. Um, yeah. I did do that, but you know, I I guess what I did that's different is I expanded it. So like, I'm also quoting. Um, you know, Buddha and Black Elk and Alan Watts and, yeah. um, you know, all, so I just, I've widened my sphere a little bit. Uh, yeah. So well, this is going to be a good book then. I mean, I know we're not here to talk about your book, but yeah, yeah. Uh, do you have a date yet on it? Oh, pff, no. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't. No. So yeah, well, we, we, yeah, we're talking about your book right now, but uh, it'll be uh, probably at least another month or so. So. But you mentioned the Buddha and Alan Watts, two of my favorite people. I've never yeah, met exactly. either, but. Yeah, uh, it would be nice, but uh, maybe one day, yeah. Yeah. Beyond maybe the veil. When we're, when we're all in heaven. We're all one with the great source. What, not, to, not to derail us, but um, what, do you, what do you imagine? The, uh, Rain Wilson asked this, uh, Rain and Reza asked this of Rob Bell. Uh -huh. Like, what happens the minute you realize you're dead? Yeah. And uh, if you're still conscious, like, what is going on? That's a good one. I know it's in a the Christianese. What is heaven like? But what is like? Yeah. What do you think? It's um. You think you just like unplug and you're like, "Fuck, that was crazy." <laughs> <laughs> well, again, I don't think anybody really knows, but I guess my Obviously. my closest my theory, I guess, is um, I do kind of think we kind of wake up, right? We become aware of our existence beyond this body. And even beyond space and time, our connection, you know, kind of being anchored in space and time. I think we, I think we um, become sort of awakened to our connection with what, you know, you would call a God or source or, or whatever, divine light, spirit, whatever you want to call it. And, and I think at the same time, our connection with every other living thing in this universe, and which is going to be a mind-blowing thing to be like whoa like because again i think our christian experience has at least for i'll speak for myself my christian experience has told me that it's just this individual experience like it's i will you know wake up yeah. in, in the yeah. presence of jesus or, or in heaven or whatever and maybe my family will be there my friends whatever you know um uh, uh, family members some of I, your family and friends like not yeah, the well, ones. Was, yeah. <laughs> but um but see i think it's going to be so much more than that, I think it's going to be recognizing our our oneness and our connection with with every living thing. I think that's going to be just 
again, the, to the degree of like, uh, you know, again, like what Paul says, right? No eye has seen, no ear has heard what is in store. Like I, we can't even, we can't even imagine it. Do you think you have a locality? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't know. You're just this ambiguous thing. Well, no, I mean, thing, like... uh, again, it's just theory. So who knows? But I, I, I guess I, maybe because I'm not comfortable with the idea of losing my individual, you know, awareness of my individual self yeah. that I, I don't want to say that like, that's just obliterated and, and it's just gone. I don't think that, but, it's tough though because like the more I'm thinking about non-duality and uh, all of that, I don't know. It kind of gets to this really kind of crazy level too of like what is God or who is God? Like if maybe God is all of us, right? It's it is all of us, but it's not. Um, Again, it's not these individual little cells of individual people. Um, it is and it isn't, right? It's all of us together corporately. But but again, I still kind of feel like there is some measure of individuality. But who who knows? Maybe not. Maybe I just don't understand non-duality. Because, because it seems like if there is, if we do retain some individuality, then, then that's, is that not, not, is that still separation? You know what I mean? For me, See, I would say I would say no. I would say it, in, it includes the individuality, and so I think the truly non-dual would include the individual. Yeah, that, that's my thinking. Because um, it's kind of like how Richard Rohr says, like to reject all dualism is itself dual. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And that that's kind of my problem with the way I've I've read some books recently. Like I'm reading a really great book right now on the Gospel of Thomas, and it's um, Tomash. Yeah, it's uh, and in the book, the guys, um, I, th I think correctly, kind of cracking the code on Thomas and saying that Thomas is a non-dualistic um, text, and that all the sayings of Jesus in the Gospel of Thomas are pointing us to, um, you know, oneness and uh, the lie of separation and non-duality and all that. But at the same time, I feel like the author presses it so hard sometimes that I that I feel like, like you you just said. Um, it it sort of ends up refuting itself now, mm. <laughs> like like uh, like the Richard Rohr quote you just had, like that non-duality yeah. when it's so uh, hardcore that it's like it kind of refutes itself. Like I do think in some maybe it's a paradoxical way, yeah, that you can have non-duality and yet still have a measure of individuality. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I'm to the place now where I think the the major truths of the universe are paradoxical. So if you yeah. say like the law of love, well, the minute you make law out of a lo out of love, the make is the minute you've like kind of refuted love. But that's right. the point is to get you to like linguistically understand that there there is a paradox there. Yeah. Um and that's and then like thinking about God in that way, I think I think of God as a paradox too, like you know when God when Derek says God doesn't exist, I'm like, yeah. And God is no thing. Yeah, God is nothing. So I think of God now, not as anything that exists in the world, but as like the infinite nothingness in which anything can flow into. Wow. See, so I don't. I, so I don't have a. You know, this this would transcend what I wrote in Heretic, probably. But like, I don't have any concept of of God as anything, as anything that you can like point to, except to say that that through God's infinite like nothingness everything can exist. Okay, so let me let me just kind of <laughs> Sorry if these are stoner thoughts, dude. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, this is this is a good conversation. I we're totally off from what we were started off talking about. But That's um, all right. Yeah, but um because he I would say maybe the opposite of that. I would say I think God is not that God is nothing, that God is everything. God is consciousness, all consciousness. So to say that God doesn't exist to me is like saying consciousness doesn't exist. Like, what are you talking about? You can't even say God doesn't exist except that you're conscious. And there, you're, you, the fact that you exist and you have a consciousness. Um, but does is, consciousness exist? Or well, is it just, 
I mean, maybe we def- we, yeah, what is existence then? So, I, yeah, I don't know. Well, I would say consciousness exists, but um, and maybe it's because, like, I again, I, I'm still thinking through these things, but like, I really loved uh, Amit Goswami. Anyone who book. anyone who's thinking is still thinking through it. Yeah, yeah, uh, Amit Goswami's book, right? The Self Aware Universe, right? And this idea yeah. that consciousness. I don't think because again, philosophers for the longest time and scientists were trying to figure out the answer to the question, you know, how does consciousness arise from matter, right? From, you know, just the physical universe. And and now realizing through quantum and stuff that it's the wrong question that we should be asking, how does matter arise from consciousness? That consciousness right. is the original cause. Right. And that without consciousness you can't have anything else. So I guess I'm that's kind of my starting point of like, well, then that's God. And um and so yeah, but before okay, but before let's say the Big Bang is true, before that consciousness was then yes, because the matter that is in the first few seconds of the universe didn't yes. bring about the consciousness, but there was still consciousness. Consciousness, but there was, existed, but there yeah. was nothing. There was oh, still nothing. Uh, so there was consciousness, but there was nothing though. Oh, but when it says nothing, is does it just mean there was no physical matter, but there was consciousness? Yeah. I don't know, man. Yeah. I got to take a shower now. This is too. This is too crazy. <laughs> it's 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 a wild. It's a wild. Um, it, maybe it's ivory towerish. I don't know. Um, yeah. That's why I've I've I like to kick around these ideas and wonder what it's all about. Um, like there's this um, book that Mike and I talk about and we've listened to on Blinkist. Have you ever heard that? It's like uh, it's an app where you can go through books in like 15 minutes. Oh wow. Um, I think the book is like called on having no head oh. and, and it goes, it goes from this like premise of that. You can never actually like see your head. You're just seeing this void. And then it gets to all the way to, I don't even know where it goes, but it's like mind blowing shit. But, it, but then at the end of it, you're just like, okay, what's the practical, what's the practical day to day on how I live a better life. And it's like, okay, I can see some of that. Yeah. But I I don't know. I've gotten more to the, um, like we said earlier, like it's it's gone more from the theoretical and the abstract and these kind of big ideas to like how do we how do we not be a dick in the yeah. world? <laughs> you know, that's why I wrote "Don't be a dick." Yeah, yeah you're, and you're I don't I yeah. don't quote the Bible. Yeah, the book will be out by the time this is released. So everyone, go go buy "Don't be a dick." Yes, um, it's more like how do I practically? So it's as, it's just as mundane as like. Remember to put the toilet seat down or remember to put the toilet roll, you know, right. on there. Put shit back on the shelves. Put your shopping cart back. Yes. You know, merge onto traffic at the speed that people are going. Don't, yes. you know, so all this kind of shit. Like, that's what I'm more interested in now these days. Like, yeah. Now that I think or believe that the universe is ultimately safe, as chaotic as it seems, yeah. that God is safe, that everything in the end is going to be okay. I asked you this theoretical question that you can't answer. No one can answer. What do you, what happens after we die? Right. Well, it's going to be okay. Whatever that is, it's going to be okay. Yeah, so let's so. live out in a in a let's live in a certain way. Yeah. That that brings more peace and joy and love into others' lives. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're definitely. Uh, I'm a huge fan of that sort of practical spirituality. That um, yeah. Like, who cares if you have right theology if you're a dick, right? So uh, I would rather have somebody who has bad theology, but they are really kind, giving, generous, loving, patient, forgiving person. Yeah. That's that. And, you know, a lot of times um, we, lo- we, we expect religion or spirituality or faith to produce that within mm-hmm. us, right? The fruit of those things, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Yeah. But um, in my experience and probably in yours as well, sometimes the people who are supposedly the quote unquote most spiritual are the biggest dicks. So it's like, well, it ain't working. You're not doing it right. Whatever you're doing, uh, who cares if you have good theology uh, or if you think you're right, but you're not you're not living it out in a way that's that that's sort of the proof of concept, right? Yeah. 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 Hundred percent. Like, I won't name names, but I've known some people who I'm like, man, that theology is fantastic, but goddamn, like, <laughs> yes, like you treat people like shit, bro. Yes, no, no, that's and see exactly. I I, <laughs> I know some people like that too, and it's the, and that becomes like a big turnoff. Like, yeah, I don't think so. So, yeah. so to me, even like those questions now, now when I approach these questions, like, is there an afterlife, and who, what is God, and 
you yeah. know, all that kind of stuff. Um, I approach them much more from a place of mystery of, I mean, I think it's fun and it's, yeah. it's stimulating to have those conversations, yeah. but I don't land with, I know the answer like For I sure. used to right now. Yeah. I land with who knows, you know, maybe, yeah. maybe not. And I'm okay with that. And yeah. I'm actually much happier holding loosely to some of those things now. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's the, um, I think that's the misconception of what the word faith means. Like yeah. I think faith is the wrong understanding in the way we understand faith. I like the word trust. There you go. Yeah. I want to trust that God is good. I want to yeah. trust and I don't know deductively certain, you know. So people often I just had someone comment on like I wrote something. It was funny cuz I got an email from your recent blog and my recent blog and both were about like how we don't give a shit about the Bible. Yes. And my premise was that like any sort of bi biblical authority is question begging. Yeah. You know, like it, it you're always referring like back to the Bible on why the Bible is important. It's like, because it says right there in the Bible. It seems circular. <laughs> and someone said that I'll keep my faith. You can keep your logic. Uh -huh. and I was like, see, see, that's where I don't like this idea of faith as it, it's like this blind faith for no good reason. Whereas yeah. I think trust is like, you have, a, you have a reason to trust someone. Yeah, I trust my wife. I trust my friends. And there's a reason I trust them because they've proven their value. You know, right. like there's a reason I don't trust some people like they've proven to not be trustworthy. Yeah. And it's like, ah, you keep your for one. That's like saying you keep your math. Right. Like logic is kind of <laughs> mathematical. You, you right. can't say two plus two is nine. I yeah. mean, you can, but you can't prove it. <laughs> you're speaking nonsense at that point. Yes. So yeah. I, I, I like the word trust. No, I like that too. And to me, I think that, uh, um, I think the way the word believe is used in the New Testament is more like trust, right? Yeah. So when it says believe on the Lord Jesus or believe this or believe that, uh, it, it's not about, like we have, we have gotten to the place now in, in evangelical Christianity, you know, in, in America, we have, we have emphasized belief so much. It's simply just been agreement with, right? Yes. I mentally assent to these statements or I, right. I, uh, I, I agree with these things or I believe these things. Right. But, but yeah, the you the way it's really meant is do you trust in these things, right? Do you Yeah. Um so in other words, because you believe these things, what will you do about it, right? Right. Right. And cuz cuz and I think you have to move to that place uh, because otherwise you end up with this kind of magical thinking of stuff like like when people will say I've actually had people say this like uh well, you know, uh, it's Paul says in Romans that um anyone who confesses that Jesus is Lord will be saved. Okay, you understand, right? That those aren't magic words. And I literally yeah. had a friend of mine say to me once, she had a friend who worked with her who was not a Christian. And she goes, I'm trying to get her, like trick her into saying Jesus is Lord. Because that, that verse in Romans says that anybody yeah. who says, who confesses with their mouth, Jesus is Lord will be saved. I'm like, yeah. I said to them, you know, you know, the point that Paul is making there is that if you say it, you're saying it because it's actually true. Because you really do sort of like have understood the teaching of Jesus and you've decided, you know what, I'm going to live this way. I'm going to put these things into practice. That's his point. Not that you just say the words. What would be the point of saying the words if you didn't mean them, if they weren't true, right? If you were lying. Um, so that's the missing thing of like, you know, we, we've now acted like, if I believe these things, that's it. That's all I got to do. But is, there's way more than that, right? It is more of like, well... No, if you say you believe those things, if you say you believe Jesus, well, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing as far as like loving people and forgiving people and serving people? And like, those are the things you seem to care about. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but with the context that they're in, like it's a, um, it becomes like a like a high stakes sort of affair. Yes, like it's it's. All those things are fine and good to help the poor and this and that. But ultimately, if you don't believe right or don't think the right things, which is, I think, why they're like confessions or faiths are now so long and lengthy instead of just <laughs> simply like a, you know, short little thing here. Um, if you, you know, ultimately, you just got to get it right so that you're in. You can help that's the right. poor and do all that. And that's all good and fine. But we've got a bigger agenda here. And, you know, once yeah. you, that's again, like once you strip that away, you're kind of like, well, well now what with life? Like I don't have to avoid hell or I don't have to 
make sure I go to church. Like, yeah, I've had some of the most lovely Sundays the last like we've been oh, gardening yeah. and getting the yard right. So it's almost planting season because we're finally going to get the the big garden done after the fire. It's like, that's, yeah, that's a Sunday. Great. That's, that's right. <laughs> I don't. And like late mornings are our perfect time. Like, man, I, I 20 years ago, I'd be at church right now. Fuck. That's what a waste terrible. of time. <laughs> what a waste of time. And that's energy. exactly right. Yeah, oh, exactly. Boy. Yeah. So let's, yeah, let's tease out, let's tease out the next episode. Um, why, why are you, why are you a heretic, Keith? Why are you, what do you mean by full heretic? I thought you were already full heretic. No? Yeah. A lot of people, that's what, that was their response to, to the, to the uh, post and to the, to the, the uh, blog I wrote. Um, You've been like, on heretic happy hour almost <laughs> four and a half years and you're now on apostates anonymous, but right. now you're going full heretic. Newsflash everybody. I'm a yes. heretic. Yes. Well, um, I guess I just kind of felt like just kind of coming out and saying out loud um, things I've been feeling for a long time, which is that, uh, as I said in the blog post, I just don't give a flying shit what anybody, what the Bible says about something. I'm so sick and tired of the Bible says, right? And um, like, you don't even, uh, I don't know. I just want us to move beyond I'm so tired of these conversations like about it with people and I have them way too often. Um, things like, you know, what do you think Adam and Eve were thinking in the garden? Like, it's a story. They are not real people. Or what do you think the devil is doing? No, the devil isn't, doesn't exist. It's a metaphor, right? So all, I'm just so sick and tired of these incredibly literalist ways of approaching the Bible and these things are just that, boring, aren't they? They're just, they're, it just pisses me off. I'm, I'm like, I'm getting to the point now where I just don't think it's cute anymore. <laughs> I just, now I'm just like, I'm stop it. I'm just so tired of it. So I just decided to come out and say, guys, look, um, yeah, I, I'm just way beyond this now. Uh, and then I wrote a blog post the other day, uh, yesterday about kind of following up to that, about how like my problem with the Bible is that I kind of don't, think there should be one. I think the canon of scripture was a bad idea uh, for many reasons. And uh, so, yeah, I talked about that a little bit. So, yeah, we can talk a little bit more about why I'm uh, going full heretic and what that means. And Yeah. I like it. Last question. Is that a large bowel in the background there? What is that on your CD shelf? What are you talking about? Yeah. Oh. What, what is what? behind you? <laughs> I know our listeners can't see. What are you talking what is, about? What is on your CD rack? What is on that right over there? On the yeah, on the top. That's a picture. What do you mean? Oh, it, oh from hold on. Here, oh, let me get it. Let me get it. it, it <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> from where I was, it was like the anatomy of a large bowel. No, so this is a drawing my friend uh, Lito did of Akira from the anime Akira. And it's like you, really cool. Are you an anime dork? No, not really. I do like no. Akira. There's a handful of things I really do like, but I don't, I don't like yeah. watch them all the time. I'm not like I'm not up to up to speed with all this, uh, all that. I stuff. heard I heard they were making an anime on uh, part of Tolkien's world. Really? The, yeah, the Helm of Helm or the something of Helm Hammerhand, the uh, the guy who like founded Helm's Deep. Oh, cool. So it would be like a precursor to the the events in Lord of the Rings. Well, I know they're doing a live action one too, right? Yeah. Amazon. Yeah. yeah, I I'm 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 holding judgment, withholding judgment from it. Um, you know, until I watch it. Is Jackson <laughs> involved with it or not? No. No, yes, Jackson's he... not. And I heard like so there was like a scholar, Tom Shippey, who's a Tolkien scholar who I think left the project. And I don't know why, like not on great terms. So that gives me a little hesitancy to be excited. Yes. Because he's like the world's, you know, best Tolkien scholar. Yeah. And so I'm like, ah, fuck. And there's a, there's <laughs> a handful of characters who aren't in Tolkien's Legendarium. Yes. And the last time they did that with The Hobbit, it was kind of a disaster. Yes. Yes. So we'll see. I hope it's good. I really do. Yeah, well, we'll see. Yeah, I'm right. withhold judgment. I mean, I love yeah. the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Yeah, I think it. 
far eclipses the Star Wars stuff completely. I remember actually when I finished watching the trilogy of Lord of the Rings, I, I literally turned to Wendy and I said, man, George Lucas, eat your heart out. Like you will never, ever make a trilogy that comes close to this. This Lord of the Rings thing is just the most amazing, epic, incredible uh, trilogy ever. It's so good. And Tolkien, like, it could be a whole episode because, I mean, is – the Lord of the Rings is such a small, I mean, it's obviously, you know, the, the creme de la creme when it comes to Tolkien's world, yeah. but it's just a part, like, it's just a part of, of the story and the mythology. And like, I don't think you can create any world as broad in scope as Tolkien did with literal languages that are yeah. actually I mean as lang I mean and literal myth like the Silmarillion is a mythology that rivals the Bible like yeah. and their mythology and it's Heresy. just like fucking hey <laughs> I could nerd out forever. Yeah. That's but we'll right. have to have Stephen Colbert on to nerd out because he's even a bigger nerd than I am. I'm yeah, like, could you get him on? I, I I'd love to do that. Well yeah I'm trying I'm trying to get um before we go here might be able to get Brian Baumgartner on yeah heretic happy hour and um someone else involved with i guess electric jesus i don't know anything about that story but oh, no, i was gonna say to me yeah. Yeah, yeah no i was gonna say i i actually was on kind of a promo team for electric jesus which was only real quick plug kevin from the office uh yeah uh, the guy you're talking about he's yeah. in that he's in that movie it's uh -huh. great it is really really a great movie and uh, especially if you were someone like me who kind of grew up in the 90s into like Christian alternative rock, like there's so many Easter eggs, so many great things. Yeah. It's it's really funny, man. Like there's a, there's so it's about these uh these kind of kids in a youth group that form a band, which is funny because I did the same thing. So I was in I was in Christian band. We all did, was, dude. Yeah. And um, and so they they have this band and they have a song called Let's All Go Commando, Commandos for Christ. Oh my God. <laughs> and I laugh it so hard because like they they're oblivious to the, to the irony and the hu the humor of what they're singing, right? They're they're thinking, you know, it's, yeah. it's about putting on the armor of God or whatever. But when the when the chorus is "Let's all go commando, commandos for Christ," I just lost it. It was so funny. There's so much stuff like that in Christianity, like <laughs> yes. on on like cringeworthy Bible signs. There's um, have you probably seen it? It's like the acronym is CLIT, or the way they put like the. <laughs> It's like the Christian leadership. It's just like, yeah. oh my God, you like, people don't. Uh, Y'all kill me. <laughs> oh yeah, there's also the one, there's a there's a sign in front of a church that has these big WTF worship teaching yeah. fellowship, uh -huh. WTF in, a, in front yeah. of the church. Like, yeah. yeah, maybe someone should pull you aside. And that one's good. What? There's, there's another funny one. It's like, um, like Jesus at the flagpole or something. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like Jesus is going to be. And then there's there's something about like a pastor is going to get his ass kicked or something. The way they worded everything, it was yes. like um, I don't remember what it is, but there's there's too many cringy Christian signs to count. Yeah, it's hilarious. I love that yeah. stuff. So yeah, if we can, if uh, hopefully yeah, you can get him because I was going to say I was about to say if you couldn't get him, that I have a contact through the Electric Jesus movie people like okay. Tom Thompson and I think the director that I could get a hold of that he might be able to connect us. But if you're okay. already on that, if you're already after him, then that sounds like you're. Yeah, on the same I'm supposed path. to be setting up a call with them to open up my blog for either Brian or someone else to write on it. Really? Like, yeah, and because well, my ultimate goal is to um, is to get them to endorse the book on the office that I have, and then oh, if I can right. get one person, then we can maybe work on getting a couple more. Oh, that'd so, be great. Yeah, Super cool. Fingers crossed. All right, man. Well, next week, full heretic. Never go full heretic. That's right. But we we are. We Let's are. Well, we're way past that, my yes. friend. <laughs> All right. Talk to you All later. Right. All right, man. Take it easy.